Annie Duke is an author, speaker, and decision-making consultant. As a former professional poker player, she won more than $4 million in tournament poker. During her career, Annie won a World Series of Poker bracelet and is the only woman to have won the World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions and the NBC National Poker Heads Up Championship. Annie is the author of several books, including the national bestseller, Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. Her latest recently released book is Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. Annie loves to dive deep into decision-making under uncertainty, and she helps others to do the same by sharing lessons learned which have been cultivated through a combination of her academic studies in cognitive psychology and real-life decision-making experiences at the poker table. Annie is active on several boards and is the co-founder of the Alliance for Decision Education, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to improve lives by empowering students through decision skills education. Welcome, Annie, and thanks for joining us on Life Excellence. Well, thank you for having me. Annie, I'm so looking forward to our conversation. Uh, first of all, because I'm fascinated by your story and I've known a little bit about you and got to learn more about you and researching for the show. And secondly, I'm fascinated by human behavior. Now, you grew up in New Hampshire and your parents were both educators and you are very well educated as well, probably because they were. And you graduated from Columbia University and then earned a master's degree. And I'm not sure people know all these things about you, earned a master's degree and completed your doctoral work in cognitive psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. You were on the verge of defending your doctoral dissertation, which is basically getting all the way through the process, as I understand it, but instead found yourself playing poker in the basement of the Crystal Lounge in Billings, Montana. Connect the dots for us. Okay, well, so yeah, so at the University of Pennsylvania, I was what's called ABD, which is all but doctored. But uh, generally, when people say that, they weren't as far along as I was, which was just come in and defend the thing. Um, but I do have some news, which I announced on Twitter a little bit ago, which is I'm now enrolled at the University of Pennsylvania to finish up my PhD. So I will be defending oh, it. Fantastic. So I will have that done within the year. Oh, that's um, awesome. So look, so so there's a couple of places to go. One is how did I end up playing poker in the in the first place? And whoa, that's a complete left turn which is the way that people kind of think about it from this path to become an academic, uh, you know, studying cognitive psychology to now you're a gambler, right? So the first thing is that uh, the reason why I ended up playing poker was actually because I got sick at the end of graduate school um, when I was going out for my job talks, which are just academic speak for job interview. Um, I had been struggling with a stomach uh, illness and I actually ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks and just honestly had to postpone um, going out on the job market and the job market in academia is seasonal. And so that meant I had to wait a year. And while I was taking time off from school, I needed money. Um, and I started playing poker mainly just out of necessity, really, because I, I needed some dough and I, I didn't feel well. I was still recuperating. So, you know, a nine to five job didn't make sense. I didn't want to start a new career because I was still planning to become an academic and I was going to go back to it. Um, and it just turned out that like I had a knack for the game and I, I, I really loved it. Um, you know, and I started making money kind of right away. Um, and so I kind of never left. It was, it's stranger. I, it sounds strange, but it's actually stranger than it sounds when you think about the time that this happened, this was in the mid nineties and, you know, now poker is ubiquitous on television. Right. Um, you know, there's internet poker, there's all sorts of access. You can, you can turn on the TV basically on any given night and see people playing poker. But that was not the case in the mid nineties. There wasn't poker on television. It wasn't widely understood to be a job that you could make money at, um, particularly not something that a woman was supposed to do. So it was odd, but I had an entree into it, which is that, um, since I had been about 16 years old, uh, my brother had actually been playing poker professionally. And so uh, that was I, how I even knew that it was a, a possibility. So that, that's just kind of like, how did I end up doing that? Um, but then to address kind of the, whoa, that's a, a weird left turn. Yeah, it's really not. 
um, the, the, what I was studying in, uh, graduate school had to do with learning and particularly learning, uh, in uncertain systems. And how do you actually take from the feedback that you're getting from the world in order to derive kind of a, a mental model of the world? And, uh, poker really sort of pulls that thread in a different way in this very high stakes, fast paced, um, world, which is just ripe with uncertainty, right? Like you can't see your opponent's cards. There's luck involved, particularly in the short, short run in terms of the, you know, how any single hand might turn out. And it, it's the kind of environment that, that is actually really hard to solve a lot of learning problems in. Like, how do you close the feedback loop? Like if you win or lose a hand, what does that mean for the decisions that you made? Um, you know, did you play the hand in an optimal way? And that's hard to know because, you know, mostly you don't see the other opponent's cards. You don't really know what the other options are um, that you could have taken. And it's an environment where the types of cognitive biases that, um, you know, Daniel Kahneman writes about in Thinking Fast and Slow um, really are going to are gonna um, get a chance to sort of take root and grow. Because sometimes, like the more certain the environment that you're in, the more tethered to a sort of objective rationality you have to be. So, uh, you know, as an example, if we take if we took a game that has less uncertainty, like chess, where I can see my opponent's position and the cards don't, uh, the, sorry, the, the pieces don't randomly move by the roll of some dice, it's very hard if I lose a game to feel like I just got unlucky, right? I mean, like, I'm, I'm just sort of tethered to having to admit that maybe I should, like, examine the decisions that I made and you probably outplayed me. Um, but in poker, that's not the case, right? In poker, because there is this really strong influence of luck, and I often kind of don't end up getting the information I would need in order to kind of tie me to the mast, right? Um, when I lose a hand, it's very easy for me to say, oh, I just got unlucky. That didn't have anything to do with my decision making. Um, the other player, you know, played really poorly. That wasn't my fault. These kinds of things. And, and that's just the case in, in those types of environments. And I found that really fascinating. And I think that... Um, you know, as I think about my path in life, that I've always studied and thought about the exact same problem. I've just thought about it in different environments. And initially, it was in an academic environment, and then it was in poker. And then later, um, you know, as a business consultant, so writing on the topic, really sort of diving into the research to think about how you would communicate these, these topics to uh, people who, you know, don't have PhDs, like me, <laughs> I don't have a PhD right now. Um, and I sort of have pulled that thread, I think, through my whole life. Yeah, those are they're very different thoughts, poker versus cognitive psychology or the thought of getting a, a PhD at an academic institution. But, but in fact, there is intersection between the two. How did your educational background give you an, an edge as a poker player if it did? So obviously you, you understood people um, arguably better than most people around the table. Did that help you? And I know we'll get into decision-making and versus luck and that sort of thing, but, but just in, in terms of your background, did that give you an edge at the poker table? You know, I, it's so hard to say, right? It, because I, I think it's a, it, it's a little bit like, well, what sort of, what is the cause and effect? Because I think that a lot of the sort of, you know, a lot of the sort of traits that I have that made graduate school something that I would want to do, particularly graduate school in the sciences, uh, thinking about the types of problems that I want to think about are similar traits that made me good at poker. Um, so, you know, the fact that I had studied human behavior um, in graduate school, like, did it help me? I don't know. I mean, I, I'd taken, you know, certainly statistics and kind of understanding statistical modeling definitely helped me that mm -hmm. I had had that background. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's, it's so hard for me to say, right. What was it, was it the fact that, you know, I studied these things in graduate school that sort of gave me a knack for being able to play poker or was it the exact same Genesis to both, right. That these were things that I was really interested in and, and trying to think about and trying to solve for that made me want to go and do two different 
things that looked very different, but that were sort of studying the exact same thing. Um, you know, it's just kind of hard for me to say, I think. I think I would be making up a story if I tried to answer that for you. Yeah. What is it that professional poker players do that amateur poker players don't do? If you had to pinpoint two or three distinctions, and I, yeah. I, I know this is there, there's a lot to it, and, and this could be a, a very long discussion, but if you had to pinpoint two or three distinctions, what is it that pros do that um, everybody else doesn't do, and that's why most other people end up broke? Yeah, so uh, there's kind of there's two main things, um, separate and apart from the real students of the game, but there's two main things. One is that uh, professional poker players tend to be more aggressive in general and tend to uh, be aggressive in the right spots. So, so that just means like, you know, if you have a choice to continue to play the hand, you could call or you could raise. Uh, sometimes actually, interestingly enough in poker, there's often a choice between folding and raising. I um, mean, that's a very common choice that you might make in poker, which sounds a little weird because if you're folding, you're saying you're willing to give up the hand. But sometimes you feel like, uh, well, I could give up the hand, but also if I raise, maybe the other person will give up the hand. So it's a common choice that you make. Um, and poker players are, are just, I think, better at the aggressive part. Um, they're more likely to choose raising over calling. Um, I think that they see the opportunities in the way that amateurs don't when, you know, I'm pretty sure I have the worst hand, but I actually think that raising is probably the better choice here. Um, and so I think that's one of the things, the key distinctions um, between amateurs and pros. But the other distinction, which I think is actually the biggest one, um, apropos my book, is that uh, poker players quit a lot more than amateurs do. Mm -hmm. And wow, that seems like such a weird thing. Like, why would that give you an edge? Um, and the reason that it would give you an edge, and this is sort of a lesson to take into life, is that if the hand isn't worth playing, then continuing to play it is actually going to cause you to lose money. Because if the hand isn't worth playing, that means it's not worth your investment anymore, that you're going to get a negative return on the next dollar that you put into the pot. And so uh, continuing uh, is actually what's going to cause you to go broke. But if you're actually really good at cutting your losses, which, you know, as we'll talk about today, is actually incredibly difficult to do, then that's going to actually allow you to get use your money in the best spots possible, right? Like to invest in the hands that have the highest return on investment available to you that have the highest expected value. So we can see it in really kind of three overarching ways. The first is that, you know, if you take a game like Texas Hold'em, where you get two cards, dealt two cards to start, you have a choice when you get dealt those two cards, whether you want to fold right away or whether you want to continue with the hand and play. You could, you could call, you could raise, whatever. And uh, amateurs tend to play over about, over about 50% of the hands that they're dealt, um, just right off the bat. And professionals tend to play about 15 to 25%. And folding is an act of quitting. I don't want to play this hand anymore, right? So they're just better at kind of that decision there. Then it gets even worse because as you put money into the pot, it becomes much harder for most people to fold. Um, and the reason that it, I think there's a few reasons that it becomes really hard for people to fold that the, the first is that you'll hear people say sentences like I needed to protect the money I already had in the hand. They want to protect their chips or they'll say something simple like I had too much money in the pot, which is kind of saying the same thing, right? Like I had money in there and it, if I fold, that's the moment that I abandoned that money, right? That I abandoned those chips and I can't get them back, at least not on this particular hand. Um, and of course, so this is very classically called the sunk cost effect or the sunk cost fallacy, thinking that the mm. money that I put in the pot should matter to whether I should put another dollar in the pot, because it shouldn't. It should matter if the next dollar I put in the pot, I'm going to make money on. And um, professionals are just better at sort of abandoning those situations. I, I think another contributing factor to that is it's very painful for amateurs to fold a hand and then have more cards come and see that they might have won. You know, and of course, it's sort of the, even a blind squirrel, right, can find a nut or a broken clock is right twice a day. You know, it's just a part of the game that sometimes you're going to fold hands that would have won if you happen to have stayed until the end. Um, and I think, you know, professional is just more sanguine about that. It's like, OK, so, you know, well, I folded a hand correctly and then a miracle card hit. That didn't mean it was right to play. So we have, you know, folding right away, folding in the middle of a hand. And then poker professionals are also better at getting up in a game. 
So when I'm playing in a game and the game is what we would call really juicy, meaning uh, there's very bad players in the game, uh, and then something happens, like maybe I'm not playing well or I'm tired or a couple of the players that were sort of the reason that I was playing get up and leave and they're replaced by much better players, uh, that's a good time to get up and quit the game. Um, and particularly when someone's losing in the game, that's actually a very difficult decision for people to make. And professionals are just better at doing that. And what that ultimately means is that um, professionals are keeping themselves in situations much less often where they're betting money when they have a negative expected return on that money that they're betting. And they're in situations more often where they're betting money where they have a positive expected return. Uh, and I think that that's one of the, th that is probably the biggest difference between experts and amateurs in that game. And so they're less tied to the outcome on a transactional basis too, right? Is that, um, it, yeah, it sounds, right. to me like, sounds to me like detachment of emotion. So a amateurs tend to get really emotional about lots of things, probably starting with the two cards in Texas Hold'em, whereas for a, a professional, that's a, a transaction. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I wouldn't necessarily use the word uh, emotional it, just because I think that these are deep, deep cognitive biases that are really kind of coded into our mindware. Um, and I can show you all sorts of places outside of the poker table where you have these exact same kind of issues, like this desire to know how things turn out, right? And that pain of kind of, oh, it maybe it you know it would have worked out if I had just stayed. Um, you know, over optimism, thinking you have a better chance to win than you actually do, but also the sunk cost effect, right? Like this pain of giving up something that you've invested in some sort of endeavor. And, you know, in the simplest sense, it's like if you buy a stock at 50 and it's trading at 40, it's really hard to sell that stock because that's the moment that you go from having a $10 loss on paper to realizing a $10 loss. And if you think about it, as long as you still hold the stock, you have a chance that the stock will go back up and you won't actually have to lose the money on that stock. Now, obviously that's silly, right? If you were gonna buy the stock at 40, then you should still continue to hold it because that's the same as buying. But if you weren't gonna buy the stock at 40, it doesn't matter what's happened prior to that decision, less transaction costs, you should just go ahead and sell it because you wouldn't. it isn't something that you would put anew into your portfolio that day. And that's separate and apart from our job as say investors is to hold over our lifetime the best possible portfolios of stocks. And as you point out, if we think about it as a transaction, what happens on a single stock matters very little, right? It's sort of across all of the decisions we make, but we can take it out of stocks as well. It's like, um, you know, people take jobs and they don't want to quit them because they don't want to have wasted all the time that they've already put into their current position because they're afraid of the unknown of what happens if I go and look for another job and I don't like that one either right? Um, who will I be if I lose my job? It's my identity. Th these kinds of things that make it hard to walk away. Same with relationships. You can see the behavior on the top of Everest, right? Why under terrible conditions, conditions that an outside observer can see very clearly are, are conditions where you shouldn't continue up the mountain. Do people continue to the summit and perish up there? For, for really, honestly, in a very deep way, the same reason that a poker player can't fold their hand. Yeah. I, after reading Thinking in Bats, I was thinking about um, decision making, and I think it's human nature to equate the quality of a decision we make with the quality of the outcome. And so, in, in other words, when we don't get the, the desired outcome that we seek, we tend to fault our decision. Um, we, we say things like, I made a bad decision or I made the wrong decision. And we, we certainly question the decisions of others when it doesn't result in the, the outcome that we're looking for. But you seem to defend decision making or at least separated from the outcome, suggesting, and, and you mentioned this earlier, luck, this, this component um, that, that, that we don't take into account very much, I don't think, when we're thinking about um, decisions that we make and the outcomes that are achieved that either are consistent with that or, or um, go against that. Share more about the, the role of luck in that and why um, maybe we shouldn't beat ourselves up about an outcome um, we, when we 
um, made a sound decision or a, at least um, thought about it carefully and, and gathered all the information and took a lot into account before making the decision that we made? Yeah, so pr pretty much every decision we make is under the influence of two forms of uncertainty, a little bit that we've touched on already. Uh, the first is hidden information. So for most things that we're deciding about, we know very little in comparison to all there is to be known. Um, so you can think about something like a hiring decision, right? Like how much do you really know about any candidate that you hire into a position? Uh, you've probably had a couple interviews with them. They're relatively short. Uh, you may have a few references. Um, and that's about it, right? Like they've never been in the job before. And I think that we've all had that feeling post-decision, oh, if I knew then what I know now, I would have made a different choice. And that's that, you know, visceral feeling of, of what hidden information does to you, that there's just stuff that you don't know. Um, and that obviously makes decision-making quite difficult. And, and when you're trying, when you're making decisions, what you're trying to do is sort of gather up, uh, you know, considering the cost of the time to gather the information, the most accurate information that you can have, you're trying to fill in those gaps as best as you can, but you can never, you know, it's almost never that you can fill those in completely, right? So that that's kind of the first piece of the problem. And the second piece of the problem is that there's just the influence of luck. So, um, you know, I can be uh, going through an intersection, I can follow all the laws of the road, um, my car can be in good repair. I, I'm going through a green light um, and somebody hits me because I can get in an accident. It's not in my control. It's just bad luck, right? It, so so that's, that's the other issue is that there's just the issue of luck. So what that means really when it comes down to it is that every decision that we make is a forecast. It's a forecast of the future in the same way that someone might forecast the weather, right? Given what I know now, given the information that I have, given the way that I might model this, so on and so forth, uh, you know, I think there's a 30% chance of rain in the coverage area tomorrow. Um, and this is where we kind of get into trouble is that what that means is that if you looked at all the forecasts that somebody made, where they forecasted a 30% chance of rain in the coverage area, we could then understand very deeply from the outcomes, what the quality of that forecast was, because we could say, given enough of these forecasts, what we would have to see is that it actually rained 30% of the time when they said it was gonna rain 30% of the time, but that would be over many, many forecasts. The issue that we have in trying to untangle these problems is that on a given day, on one day, where I forecast a 30% chance of rain, it can't possibly be 30% rain, right? It's either gonna rain or it's not going to. Those are the only two things that can happen. Um, so while prospectively, our decisions are probabilistic in nature. In other words, we're trying to make decisions that have the highest probability of getting us to gain ground toward whatever it is that we wish to achieve, right? Um, for any given, for any one single outcome that we look at, it's either gonna be like good or bad. I mean, it's, you know, it's either gonna rain or it's not. So, so when we look in retrospect, we lose sort of, we lose all that sense of the fact that it was probabilistic in the first place. And it's like, and we see this all the time when, you know, they say it's a 70% chance of rain and then there isn't any rain that day. People are like, the weather person was wrong. It's like, well, I don't really know what wrong means in that sense, right? If I knew that they said, whenever they said 70%, it actually only rained 10% of the time, I'd say they're a terrible weather forecaster. But if they were using a reasonable model and I could take a look at how they came to that decision and I could see that uh, that decision was actually going to, you know, produce rain 70% of the time if I looked at enough data points. Then what I would just say is they made a good forecast and one time doesn't really tell you very much. So our minds just are not good with that sort of conceptually. And this is a problem that I call resulting in cognitive science. It's known as outcome bias, uh, which is that trying to sort of dig down into, was a decision good or bad? In other words, the process that you used to make a decision, did you have, you know, did you discover the information that was discoverable? Did you forecast sort of the way that luck might influence the outcome of the decision as best as you could? Um, which is really has to do with what the decision process looks like. That's very complicated, particularly in retrospect. 
But knowing like, was the ball intercepted or was it caught for a touchdown? Did I get in an accident or not? Did it rain or not? When I agonized over what to order on the menu, did I like my dish or didn't I? Right. That is actually quite uncomplicated. That's very easy to see. And so what we do is we sort of simplify this problem for ourselves in a way that wreaks havoc where we say, well, I know what the quality of the outcome is. So therefore I can work backwards to that, to the quality of the decision. And that's just a huge error when all four of these things can be true. You can make a good decision and have a good outcome. You can make a good decision and have a bad outcome. You can make a bad decision and have a good outcome. And you can make a bad decision and have a bad outcome. And in a world where all four of those things can be true, you can't work backwards from the quality of one single outcome. Yeah, so it sound, what you're saying is um, it sounds like you're trying to make us feel better about having outcomes that aren't in a, a alignment with the, the decisions that we made. You, you wrote that um, life like poker is one long game and there are going to be lots of losses even after making the, the best possible bets. And, and I think for human beings, that's hard to get our arms around. I mean, I hear you and I want to feel okay about that. But the reality is if I was planning to go to the beach because the weatherman said that or weather woman said that it was going to be a nice sunny day and it ended up raining, um, it's hard for me to, to not, um, not be critical of that. It, and, and so some of what you're suggesting sounds like resignation or at least a, a reality check that, hey, um, sometimes you're going to make decisions that don't have good outcomes, you know, your four possible scenarios. It, are there things we can do to um, make better decisions and, and stack the odds in our favor? Or are we just sort of resigned to the idea that, that sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't go well. I mean, it, that's the whole bag, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so let me just, first of all, say like, look, I can explain resulting to you. And of course, when you order the chicken at a restaurant and it comes back poorly, you're still going to think you made a mistake. So I'm, I'm very aware of that. Um, the question is though, how much, do you accept that in yourself? Like, is there something in you that says, well, maybe it wasn't a mistake. Let me actually think about the quality of the decision I made. Um, regardless of how you feel, right? Regardless of whether you feel it's a mistake, because in the end, you know, we, we sort of have to learn from our experiences and we have to be able to close these feedback loops in a way that makes sense. And if we're going to improve our decision-making going forward, which is how you actually end up improving your life, because it's the thing that you have control over, right? Because you, you don't have control over anything except for your own decisions. That's what you have control over. Um, then it's really bad if you get a good outcome out of a bad decision and you just assume, oh, that must've been a great decision because I got a good outcome, right? It would, it would be like going and playing, you know, back around where you're losing two and a half cents on every dollar that you play winning and thinking that you should quit your job and become a professional back route player, right? Oh, that would be silliness, but that's sort of the equivalent to what we're doing a lot of the time. And likewise, you can have a bad outcome and you shouldn't think that you shouldn't repeat the decision. It would, that would be as silly as saying, I went through a green light. I got in an accident. So I better start going through red ones, which we don't want to do. But on some scale, we do that every single day. So it's about stopping yourself from doing it as much as possible, which may be only a little bit more than you would have otherwise, but that little bit more actually really makes a huge difference. And yeah. the way that you do that is really getting laser focused on the hidden information problem. Um, because that's the thing that you can actually do something about. And in particular, not just trying to figure out how do I, how do I really improve the, the quality of the information, uh, you know, not just the quantity of information that's going into a decision, but more importantly, how do I actually get dis different perspectives on the decision that I'm making? Because, you know, as I said, we're all, each of us is very riddled with bias, right? The way that we think about the world is shaped through our own perspective and our own experiences. And often it's shaped by what we want to be true of the world, right? If we went back to, for example, the sunk cost effect, the decision that I make about whether I should sell a stock is going to be affected by whether I've lost money in the stock to date. But you somebody outside of me who has, who has a different perspective, you aren't subject to that same bias because you don't own this stock. 
So you may be able to see that you may have a different perspective on what I should do or what my decision should be that doesn't, uh, that, that kind of helps to cancel my bias out, right? So if you think about intuitively, like why do businesses have teams? The idea is that you're supposed to bring different perspectives to the table. Now, most of the decision-making that occurs on teams actually doesn't do that, but if you do it right, then you can actually ac access those different perspectives. Um, and that's the single most important thing you, that you can do to improve decision-making. The second most important thing you can do is to write it down. So as you're going through a decision process and you're trying to make like these forecasts of the future and what are the different options we have and how do I think those different options might turn out uh, given the resources that we have to put into it, how are different people thinking about the problem? What are their rationales for why they believe what they do? Create a written record of it. Because then when you do get a good or bad outcome, you don't have to guess at what you were thinking at the time, which is often distorted, right? Uh, by resulting, by hindsight bias, there's a few things that can really cause us to misremember in a very significant way um, what we thought at the time. Uh, but if we have a record of what we thought at the time, it becomes much easier to go in and sort of examine the decision we made to try to figure out if there was information that we missed that might have been accessible at the time. Uh, so that we can start to actually disentangle the outcome from the decision process and then start to improve those processes going forward. But it requires both of those things in order to be able to do it. What's the tool for being able to document that? So is that journaling or does it take the form of some sort of matrix or what do you recommend on that? So, you know, on an individual basis, you can do journaling, you can actually draw decision trees. Uh, you can do weight and rate tables. There's a variety of things that you can do in order to document that process. I would say your mileage might vary on that. Um, in terms of team decision making, you know, it's now it's it, I there really people don't have meetings anymore that don't have agendas, uh, and there's a reason for that, right? Because it creates discipline to the meeting. But for any agenda item, that means that there's feedback that you're looking for from the team, and. Uh, you shouldn't just, in my opinion, send a, an agenda out for the people who are going to be involved in the meeting, but you should think in advance, what, what are, what are, what are the judgments that I'm trying to get from the team? What are their rationales? What's the feedback that I'm trying to get? And actually ask the team independently and asynchronously to get you that. In other words, in a sense where you're not reply all, right? Where, where each person can offer their opinion. Um, and those are opinions that you would be discovering in the room, right? Uh, discover them beforehand so that people are, are, not under the influence of other people in the room and things that have to do with leadership and seniority and charisma uh, and this kind of thing. And they can offer up their opinion. Um, and then that naturally creates a record because now what you have is the judgments of each independent member of the team, um, generally with some sort of rationale for that judgment recorded. And that then gets fed back to the group prior, prior to a meeting occurring. And those judgments could be in the form of many things, right? They could be brainstorms, for example, like brainstorming is better done independently and then discussed as a group. It could be, um, you know, questions that you have, like uh, if you're, you know, if you're on a hiring committee, right? Like there could be a question about, um, you know, on a scale of one to seven, how strong do you think this candidate will be as an executive partner where seven is the strongest and one is the least strong and people have to give a judgment there. And then what's your rationale for this, for this judgment? Why, you know, you gave them a five, why? Right. And then they can write some free form information. Uh, that's another way that you can get judgment. Sometimes it's a forecast. Um, we're going to be talking about how long, how many resources this project is going to take. Uh, can you tell me how many weeks with a lower bound and an upper bound or how many months you think this is going to take to complete? Um, how, you know, how much money do you think it's going to cost? What do you think the return on investment is going to be? Whatever you might be discussing that you would normally be discussing in, a, in the context of a meeting, you can get those judgments in advance. And then that naturally creates a record, at least as far as team decision making goes. That makes sense. That's good. Thank you. Annie, your latest book was just released and it's a book about quitting. And I have to tell you, and I actually mentioned this offline to you, I wrestled with this concept a lot, um, especially before reading the book. 
we've been taught our entire lives to persist through adversity and motivational quote books. And I'm a, a big motivation guy are filled with advice to persevere. And I think it was Churchill who said, never, never, never give up. Um, quitting has such a negative connotation in our society, but you maintain that same fortitude can get us into trouble because it sometimes causes us to stick to hard things um, long after we they're no longer worthwhile and we should have stopped. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, here, here's the thing, like, yes, Grit and quit stand in, in sort of opposition to each other. And it's very clear that we think about grit as a virtue and quit as a vice, right? Just, just you're right. Like winners never quit. Quitters never win. Um, you know, we think about grit as character building, but I'm with you. I think that grit is an incredibly important character trait to have. I think everybody should read Angela Duckworth's book, Grit. Yeah. I think it's great. Um, but the thing that what we need to realize is that you can't make a blanket statement like quitting is weak willed and terrible and grit is awesome without understanding the context. Because really, if you think about it, they're the exact same decision, right? If you choose to persevere, you're choosing not to quit. If you choose to quit, you're choosing not to persevere. So it's a matter of calibration. And it will take me one second to tell you all sorts of places where it's obvious that somebody should quit. So if you're at the top of Everest and a blizzard comes in, do you think you should continue to the summit? Should you persevere there? Of course not. Should turn around, right? If you're, um, you know, if if uh, if you're in a football game and you get a concussion, should you keep going, or should you take yourself out of the game? You know, obviously you should quit. Uh, if you're blockbuster and you're selling physical cassette tapes, you know, DVDs in a uh, physical location, and streaming comes on the horizon. Should you persist in that business strategy and that business model? Well, no, not, not at the point that the information is clear that you ought to pivot. And, um, and when you have a chance to buy Netflix, should you probably do that, right? I mean, most businesses that have gone out of business, including Sears, you know, you can very seer clearly see a failure to quit. Uh, people hurt themselves all the time by not quitting. If you're in a toxic relationship, is perseverance a virtue? Or is that folly? If you're in a dead end job that you hate in, in a, in, with a business that has a culture that, that uh, is making you miserable, is it a character, is it character building to stay in that situation? Or are you better off leaving? And, you know, as obvious as that is, you can just look at the motivational quotes to, to understand that it's not really the way that our minds work, right? Like we, we don't like to quit. We think it's bad. And yet here I am, like we're, I think we're in agreement about all these situations where quitting um, is the right thing to do. And, and in the end, I think the problem is this really is that we think that quitting is going to stop your progress, right? It's going to stop your progress and make it so that you don't get to your goals as fast as you might otherwise. But it's not true. That's only true if the road that you're on, the thing that you started, is getting you to where you want to go. But there's all sorts of situations in which the thing that you're doing is actually not a good thing for you to be doing. It's causing you to lose ground or not gain very much ground in comparison to other things that you might be doing. And in that case, when you quit at those times, it speeds you up. It actually allows you to get to where you want to go faster because you get off a road where there's a tractor trailer that's turned over and traffic is stopped. And you get to switch and get your car on a new road where the traffic is moving fine. And well, no. go ahead. Excuse me. I was just going to say in, in some of those instances, it's easy to evaluate in hindsight, but not always easy in the the thick of it. So maybe, maybe Blockbuster was an easy one and, and somebody should have seen that or um, Polaroid is, is a really great example of, of new technology um, coming into the mainstream and, and just completely ignoring that technology, which is basically what Blockbuster did. But there are other situations like Sears is sort of, I, I'm, I don't know that there was a, a point at which, I mean, even looking back in hindsight, a point at which you would have said, or I would have said, geez, they should have um, moved out of this 
um, yeah, so I, I would actually say, so, so let me just say, first of all, that this is part of the problem is that, you know, as Richard Thaler who won a Nobel laureate, I like to listen to Nobel laureates. So I'm going to quote with Richard Thaler for you said, most of us aren't willing to quit until it's no longer a decision. In other words, we need to have so much certainty that it's the only thing that we could possibly do before we're willing to walk away from something. And obviously that's long after you should have walked away from something. Right. Yes. So this is a little bit of a forecasting problem in the same sense that the decision to start something is also a forecasting problem where we're choosing to start something, a business or whatever, whatever it is, a relationship. And uh, we don't really know how it's going to turn out. We're making our best guess of how it's going to turn out. And then you learn all sorts of new information. There's information discovery after the fact. And we should be able to react to that. Right. So when we get negative signals from the world that tell us that the thing we're doing is not going as planned or that at some point it has stopped going as planned, we ought to be willing to switch. Um, except we won't do that because we're so afraid that we'll have wasted our time or maybe we could have turned it around or that's the moment that we go from failing to having failed, which is not a moment that we enjoy as human beings. And so we stay the course despite all the signals blaring at us that we ought to be switching. And we need those alarm bells to be so loud as to be deafening before we're willing to do that and actually and actually say, okay, it's over, we failed. And if we go to something like Sears, uh, it's actually very obvious the moment that at, at least this may have even been too late, but uh, we know the moment that where they really went wrong. So, you know, Sears was, uh, we all know, a retail company, right? Um, and it was huge. I think in the 50s, it represented 1% one, 1 of GNP, which is pretty... Oh right? Whoa. Um, so it's a really big store. But then what happened was, you know, Walmart comes along and Kmart comes along and eventually Target comes along on the low end. And then on the high end, you end up with like the Saks and the Neiman Marcuses and, and whatnot. And Sears kind of loses its place in the retail um, space. And by the 90s, it's no longer the number one retailer in the country. Um, and as we know, it ended up going bankrupt. Now, what was the point at which they should have sold? Well, it was Sears that we actually have enough information. We, there was enough information at the time, actually, to, to kind of know what they should have done. So the unknown story of Sears that people don't realize um, is that Sears was also a financial services company. So in the simplest sense, back in the 1800s, when they had a catalog, they had to offer their customers credit. Uh, so they had a banking division. Um, and then, uh, you know, along came kind of the late 20s and 30s when people started having cars and it started to uh, eat into their catalog business. And so they started to create physical locations uh, that people could drive to to buy things. And when they did that, they realized, oh, um, people have these new cars. Uh, maybe we should start selling insurance for the cars because they're driving the cars to our stores. We could have a desk in the store that sells them insurance for their cars. So they founded a company called Allstate Insurance. So I don't know if you knew that Sears owned Allstate, but they did. Yeah. Um, and Allstate obviously w was booming and ended, ended up becoming the largest, um, you know, insurer of not just of any kind of personal liability and also life. Then um, that was going so well that in the 70s, they acquired a company called Dean Witter, which for those who are older will remember it was a big financial services company. Um, a stockbroker. They also founded the Discover Card. So that was right. a Sears entity. Um, and then they also uh, bought Coldwell Banker, uh, which is mm -hmm. a, was a real estate company. Um, they Then what happened was, you know, this was right around the time that they have this booming financial services empire um, that the retail business really starts to flail. So it's faltering and it's starting to lose money. And the shareholders are demanding action and the board makes the decision that the solution to all of this is to get back to their retailing roots. So they decide to sell all the financial services off. So they sell off Allstate. They sold D Dean Witter to Morgan Stanley. It was Dean Witter Discover at the time uh, to Morgan Stanley. And at the time that represented 40% of Morgan Stanley's worth. So think about what Morgan Stanley is worth today if you wanna understand how big that transaction was. Uh, I think Coldwell Banker ended up merging with uh, some other companies and became Reology. I think their market cap is something like $2 billion, I think. 
Um, and I believe that Allstate, its market cap is something like $40 billion. Um, and they sold that all in the, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and then they went broke. So when were they supposed to pivot? Well, I would say that that's the moment. You have one part of the business that's losing money. And you have another part of the business that's making money hand over fist. Now, why on earth would they sell the part of the business that was making money hand over fist? Because they were a retailer, right? It's who they were. And that's the hardest thing to quit, right? You're giving up your identity and saying this thing that we've been since the 1800s, we're we're not going to be anymore in order to do this other thing. But I hope that you have the same feeling as I do of just shuddering to, to find out that they owned Allstate and still managed to go broke. So I think, in, in, yes, in retrospect, it's always easier to see the moment that you should have quit because you have much more certainty about it. But you can do it prospectively as well. I mean, that that's the thing is that those signals are there. And for Blockbuster, let's remember, they had the opportunity to acquire Netflix. The signs were there. And then sometimes right. you have this happen purposely. So um, Sony, which had the Walkman, they internally knew that digital music was coming. And there was a pros- proposal to develop something that would have been like the iPod, that would be some sort of digital music carrier. And they deliberately chose not to do it for fear of disrupting their business, which was the Walkman. So they didn't want to disrupt themselves. So they recognized that that there was a problem, right? They recognized that the signals were there, that things were going to change, and they chose not to disrupt their own business. Of course, that caused them to go broke. And this this isn't just about businesses. This is just kind of how we live our lives, is that we ignore these signals. We rationalize them away. We're selling off Allstate all the time in order to maintain whatever it is that, you know, who we are. Sure. Let me give you a different example, and and Allstate is actually a nice segue to into it because Allstate is a, a big um, NFL sponsor. Obviously, we're a couple weeks into the football season as we record this show, and I'd like to get your take on two of the greatest players to ever play the game, both of whom have ties to the state of Michigan, which is where I live. Annie. Barry Sanders, I I don't know if you're a football fan or not, but Barry Sanders was one of the greatest running backs ever. He rushed for more than 1,000 yards, which is a lot, in each of his 10 seasons as a Detroit Lion. Then at the age of 31, at the top of his game and on the cusp of becoming the leading rusher in NFL history, Sanders walked away. That's one guy. Tom Brady arguably not only the greatest quarterback to ever play the game, but perhaps the greatest athlete of all time, some people say, retired from the NFL recently and just 40 days later announced he was coming out of retirement and, of course, is back this season with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Share your thoughts on each of those decisions and how they fit into the decision-making process you describe in quit. So, look, first of all, I think that when you decide to quit on a personal level, it has to do with your own values, right? So, um, you know, some people like like Seinfeld, for example, Phoebe Waller-Bridge for, of the show Fleabag, they have a desire to not get that certainty that things have gone downhill. That's not what they want, right? They don't want to be in a situation where it's clear to the whole world that they need to walk away because, um, you know, Seinfeld has jumped the shark, right? Um, and so for some people, that's that's what they're, you know, that's what they value is I don't want to end up being a laughing stock or I don't want a people people to talk about the day that I jumped the shark. Uh, And I can see right now that I'm at the top of my game, but I don't know what next year is going to bring. And for me, that next year might might start to be the decline. And I don't want to be around for that. So I will tell you that that's an incredible act of courage for Barry Sanders to do to walk away like he did or for Jerry Seinfeld to walk away like he did. It takes an act of courage because people question it. They're like, well, why are you doing that? Right. You're at the top of your game. What, What are you, an idiot? But what's interesting is that on the flip side. When someone plays say, a, maybe a season too long, which I think that most people think that Peyton Manning did, everybody's like, what an idiot. Why didn't he quit the season before? Well, why? The season before, you know what he did. He got pretty darn far, right? And, and had he quit the season before, everybody's head would have exploded. So, you know, I think that that's the first thing to remember is that 
that ability to walk away when you're on top actually to, is an incredible act of courage to say, I think there's too high of a probability that things are going to start going downhill. And I don't want to end up saying, oh, how could he not know? They should have, shouldn't have played that extra season. Now, for some people, you know, maybe a Brady, it may just be his life that he loves playing football and he's going to get every last bit out of it, regardless of what anybody says about him. Now, he has, you know, a little bit of the comfort of doing that because he's done so well. But Peyton Manning certainly did really well. And people still sort of say, like, well, why do you stick around? It just stuck around a little too long, right? But for Brady, that might be okay because the thing he might be getting out of that, which is the enjoyment of the game, might be enough that he wants to do that. And I think that that's a value decision for him. Um, and I think that either side of those equations are fine. If you're, if you're making that kind of value decision, where I think that it goes too far in that not having the courage to walk away is when you're 300 feet from the summit of Everett and there's a blizzard and you're so afraid of failing that you won't walk away from that, that situation. And you continue on trying to make it up there anyway, because you're just so darn close. Right. And then you put your life at risk. You put your, your ability, you know, your family's happiness and, um, well-being at risk. And, um, you know, luckily uh, Tom Brady isn't doing that to anybody. He's he's living out his life's values, which I think is really important. Um, but I think there's all sorts of situations where where that particular tendency becomes really damaging. Sure. So to bring things full circle, you agree with Kenny Rogers? <laughs> yes. And and what I really agree with Kenny Rogers about is if you remember, it's no one to hold him, no one to fold them, no one to walk away, no one to run. And what I want to point out about that is three of those things are about quitting. <laughs> Only one of them is about staying. Um, and I think that's the thing that we have to remember is that as much as we think that we need to encourage grit, human beings are naturally gritty. That is our natural state of affairs. Now, I'm not talking about teenagers, right? I'm not talking about little kids. I'm talking about like people over 25 years old. Our natural state is to stick things out. And I think that we see that all the time because I imagine you've probably left relationships or left jobs or whatever, where after you finally do quit, you look back and you say, oh, I should have done that sooner, right? And I don't know anybody really who quits things and says, oh, I did that too soon. I feel like almost always people are saying, oh, I should have done that sooner. Um, and that's because all of these forces keep us at what we're, we, we're doing already, right? There's all these things that stop us from walking away from things, not the least of which is that grit is a virtue and quit is a vice. And we don't want to be seen as being weak-willed or, or lacking character. And so the thing that I want people to understand that the Kenny Rogers song is really getting is that you have to repeat three times for every one that it's okay to walk away, that this is the thing that we need to do. And often it's an act of courage. Think about how much courage it takes 300 feet from the summit of Everest to walk away, knowing that people are going to say, oh, you got that high and you didn't finish. Right. I mean, that takes a lot of courage to know that that's the right thing to do so that you can be alive so that you can so that you can live and have all sorts of opportunities available to you. And, and I think that that's actually quite hard for most of us to do. Well, it's interesting. And even in the case of Everest and even facing maybe eminent demise, I think people are still running through the tens of thousands of dollars that they've invested mm -hmm. to get yep. there. The, the year or longer investment of time and energy. And it will have been wasted. Into doing that. And it will have been wasted. They they didn't get the prize. They didn't um, complete right. their, their and, goal. And think right? about, Brian, think about what a shame that is. They climbed like 29,000 feet in the air. Higher than almost any human being ever gets. What an accomplishment. But goals are pass fail. Progress along the way matters very little, right? It's like if you run 25 miles of a marathon, you ran 25 miles, right? You failed because you didn't run the last 1.2. So think about what that does to us in terms of how much we're willing to run headlong into something that is no longer good for us simply because we have to get to the finish line. Um, and that's why I think it's such a courageous act to actually walk away, to say it's okay. The progress I made along the way was amazing. You know, I was 31. I was an incredible running back. I accomplished what I wanted to in football. And it's time for me to move on to something else. That's a really hard decision. Absolutely. But uh, Barry Sanders certainly feels that it was the right one. Yeah. Annie, you've given us so much to think about today. Um, thanks for your new book, 
um, quit the power of knowing when to walk away. And I, I think that as a result of the show today, our listeners and viewers will become better decision makers. And certainly as they read your books, they'll, they'll, um, make more informed decisions and, um, hopefully know when to quit and when to move forward. Thanks so much for being on our show today. It's been great to have you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for tuning in to Life Excellence. Please support the show by subscribing, sharing it with others, posting about today's show with Annie Duke on social media, and leaving a rating and review. You can also learn more about me at brianbardas.com. Until next time, dream big dreams and make each day your masterpiece.